be here now. Just be here now. Every time I had gotten distracted, I thought, I can't do this. I can't meditate. It's not for me. And I gave up. But now I realize that, hey, this is like practicing music. It's practice. You know, you play a piece of music, you're going to make a mistake. You don't beat yourself up. You just repeat the passage until you get it right. Mm. And when I made that connection between practicing music and practicing meditation, it all worked. And as you say, it opened up a whole new world, yeah. Hey everyone, it's Raghu. I'm back with Mind Rolling. And uh, my guest today is Richard Wolf. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. It's uh, an honor. Richard is right down the pike. Actually, I've been doing, Richard, some podcasts lately with the various musicians and so on because we have a music series, Soul Land Music. Ram Dass is Soul Land Music. Uh, so, Richard, uh, you really, this book is, it's as I said before, it's right down the pike. It's, uh, it's called In Tune, and it's, it's really around music and mindfulness. And uh, it's very instructive and well worth uh, everybody's attention. So thank you for writing that, Richard. Thank you for reading it. Um, but a little bit about yourself. I mean, I, I have some idea, but uh, what are the things that even got you to the point where something like mindfulness made sense in any way? Uh, I was forced into it pretty much because it was the only alternative that I was given to uh, get out of a very bad state of mind where I was suffering from acute anxiety and panic. And As a teenager, are you talking? No, this was, I was already uh, an adult with a family and oh, working really? in TV music. I had been in the record business, but I moved to TV thinking that would be less stressful. And, uh, boy, was I breathtakingly wide of the mark there. And, uh, so I had a panic, uh, severe panic attack and my therapist prescribed meditation. And I had been trying to do meditation pretty much since you mentioned I was a teenager. So I was 17. I went to the Zen center and I s learned how to sit Zazen. Mm. And, um, I think because I'm a musician, I was able to sit there. But my mind was completely bonkers. I mean, I, I couldn't concentrate, but I would show up and sit. Um, I couldn't do it and try it in college. I couldn't do it, but now I had to do it. Uh, if that's my prescription to get out of this panic uh, hell, I needed to, to meditate. And so uh, I researched and found a way to do it. But that obviously led to beyond just meditation. There's perhaps another world that's not my senses, thinking mind, etc. When did that happen? Well, it happens when you meditate seriously for a, a considerable amount of time. And um, what happened was, I realized. I actually, I, I read a book called "Training Your Mind to Be an Ally." by a Tibetan animal trainer who was also a meditation master. And he compared the mind to a wild animal, like a horse. He was a horse trainer. And he said, when the horse gets distracted and uh, goes off the road, you gently lead it back to the road. Now, every time I had gotten distracted, I thought, I can't do this. I can't meditate. It's not for me. And I gave up. But now I realize that, hey, this is like practicing music. It's practice. You know, you play a piece of music, you're going to make a mistake. You don't beat yourself up. You just repeat the passage until you get it right. Mm. And when I made that connection between practicing music and practicing meditation, it all worked. And as you say, it opened up a whole new world. Yeah. There were the first connection I saw was practice, practice for the sake of practice, having faith and trust and believe that no matter how 
much drudgery it is to just go over the scales, or go over the same song, you're going to be able to play it and master it if you just practice. And when I made that connection, then all these other connections, I call mm -hmm. them bridges, uh, became apparent between the practice of music and the practice of meditation. Yeah. Well, that's really uh, definitive through, through this book, that through line. Uh, and you say, underscoring these connections, the classic meditation teachings of Zana, uh, Zazen, Pranayama, and Vipassana, which is something that I was introduced to when I first went to India and has become a through line for me all, all this time, um, can be approached from an instinctively musical perspective, which you just actually connected, that's very much connected with what you just said, but maybe further that a little bit. How are these approaches, uh, how can they be approached from uh, an instinctively musical perspective? Well, it's about listening and about hearing music. It's about exploring your interior soundscape. Um, so I emphasize the listening part in terms of meditating. And, we, you know, most of it, so many meditation traditions rely on listening or actually counting the breath, paying attention, following. They call that following the breath, right? So how do you follow the breath? It's very hard to do for hours at a time, That's or minutes at a time for that matter. And um, one way is to hear tones. As you inhale, you hear a tone. As you exhale, another, another tone. It becomes an interesting uh, event without getting complicated, without getting wrapped up in specifics or technicalities. Just whatever you hear, you notice when you're breathing. Whatever tone you hear, you notice that. And the same thing with counting. Um, musicians are inherently able to count beats, right? Mm. I mean, there's a, a famous story of Albert Einstein he was a violin player and he was, he would play with uh, like the best pianists, but he had no rhythm. And uh, so one time the Vladimir Hara says to him, uh, Albert, don't you have any sense of time? <laughs> so, so we count subconsciously. You know, and the way we count is one, two, three, four, mm. two, two, three, four. So I'm getting very into the woods, into the weeds here, I guess, woods, weeds. But um, to answer your question, that's one way um, that, you know, your inherent abilities as musicians can be applied to meditation techniques. Mm. Forget about all of the mindfulness and, you know, and music and, all of it, there's one thing you've got to relate. When I saw it in the book, I went, wow, what? You had lunch with Miles Davis. I don't give a shit about anything else that's in this book, okay? <laughs> I'm kidding. But can you tell that story? That's wild, man. Yeah. Um, I, I was friends, this is the mid-80s, I think it's 1985, and I was friends with Tommy LaPuma. Mm. And Tommy LaPuma uh, was producing Miles Davis. He produced records uh, in the 80s on Miles Davis. And I was in Tommy's house. The phone rings. Apparently, it's Miles. He says, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll be there in 10 minutes. And he says to me, you want to come with me to lunch with Miles? <laughs> I'm going, yes. Wow. Uh, you know, what kind of question is, of course. So we go to this restaurant on Fifth Avenue. Tommy was living on Fifth Avenue, so it was a couple of blocks away, but it's springtime. It's kind of hot. And we go in this restaurant, I don't know, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. There's nobody there except at the end of a the table, there's a very regal looking gentleman wearing this beautiful, huge, heavy fur coat. And that was Miles. <laughs> and uh, so it was just the three of us. It was Tommy, me, and Miles. And Miles was loquacious. He was in a good mood and he was talking and, you know, telling stories. And some of the stories I would love to tell, uh, but uh, some of them may, may not be uh, appropriate, uh, proper. Um, but then he just stopped in the middle of the stories and he turns to me and he says, 
You know what the most important lesson I learn about music? I said, no, what's that, Miles? And he said, the importance of silence. Wow. And when he said that, it resonated with me. I didn't understand fully what he was talking about. I knew I needed to understand that better. But that really made a deep impression on me I'll never forget. Mm. Wow. That's a and lot for of detail. He said he he learned that from Ayerto, who was a uh, or is a Brazilian percussionist and was in his band for a while. Who's still alive? I didn't know that. I don't know. I, oh. I don't know. Uh -huh. Wow. Did you what about did you have dinner with John Coltrane, perhaps? <laughs> No, I uh, I never saw him live, but uh, I know you're a John Coltrane fan. Because uh, I had the experience, which you discuss uh, f throughout this book, or certainly as a core um, result of what music can do and how it's really, it's the same. It is meditation. And once you do get a little bit concentrated, sometimes that happens without doing anything and that happened to me with Coltrane in a club when I was very young and uh yeah I was transformed out of my little self in that moment and uh, into a level of absorption which was profound uh, it's a profound thing in my entire life that particular incident uh it made its mark so yeah Coltrane and that idea, absolutely. But the nice thing about what you talk about, Richard, is uh, you know the different ways in which you can actually take action using music to enhance meditation, mindfulness, just general spacious awareness rather than reactive uh, attachment to thoughts. I... Um, yeah, I mean, especially around attention and concentration. Yes. Talk about that from yes. your point of view. And I, I, I know you've had many years of experience using this practice. Yes. Uh, but it can be frowned upon, or it can actually be spiritual bypass, where you're doing it, where you are doing it, Right, or you're doing it for a motivation. There's a, a, to get better, even whatever it may be. So it's a difficult, you know. I mean, the eightfold path path in Buddhism, right? Right concentration mm -hmm. is there for a reason. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk right about concentration. That, is also one of the seven factors of enlightenment. Concentration. Yeah. I don't know the order, but yeah. I mean, was it okay if we go back to Coltrane for a minute? let's just again let's not talk about anything else here and, and by the way and someone like coltrane in my mind talk about enormous powers of one pointedness where he is completely one with uh, that's why him hendrix completely one with the the instrument voice yeah. instrument whatever there are a few people that you can count on maybe a few arms i don't know but well, still, not only yeah. that, he, he practiced um, with his breath, right? Uh, that's a big deal. I mean, he would practice eight hours a day. He's working on his breath. And how you can, he created what's called, as you know, sheets of sound, right? So it's a lot of notes he was able to play. So he took one breath, and with one breath, he was able to play all these different notes. And that's such an example of, of non-duality. You know, with one breath divides up into all these different notes, but it's all one. It's all one. And that was, that was a conscious thing that he did, you know, and he, he had a unique voice, right? You could, you could tell Coltrane a mile away, right? There's no mistake. That's Coltrane. So he had that singularity, but at the same time, it was effective in terms of moving you as an example. He was trying to express something universal what he thought of as divine consciousness or universal consciousness or supreme love. 
So he, again, non-dualistically, he was singular and he was universal at the same time. And, and that's something very beautiful and unique about. You know, there's a, a church uh, dedicated to Coltrane yeah, in San heard, Francisco, yeah. right? <laughs> well, and his wife certainly carried, Alice certainly carried on. His, but you asked intent. me about uh, about concentration in uh, Buddhist tradition is samadhi, right? And you get into deep concentration, and you're absolutely right. Music is a great vehicle for enhancing concentration because you're focusing all your attention, all your energies. It's not just your mental attention. It's your emotional attention. It's your physical attention. It's a physical, it's, it's all three. It's like this melody, harmony, and rhythm. Those are the three elements, right? So there's mind, feeling, and body. And it's, as a matter of fact, it's called embodied cognition. Uh, when you know- Yeah, I saw places. that. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. That, from V.J. Iyer, <laughs> amazing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And so that's what meditation is that too. You're in a state of embodied cognition. You're a state of harmony where your mind, body, and feeling are all unified as one. And that's something that's very common with music. So if you've had that experience in music, it's natural to put that over in meditation. Mm. You... Uh, have you been a, a re well, I think you have been a real f jazz fan. Is that right? Oh, I'm still, yes. Yeah. So you might remember Jackie McLean? Of course. So Piano we player. did We did a couple of records at Triloka, the company that we had, with Jackie. And uh, he, this, for those of you who do not know Jackie McLean is, he was a direct disciple of Charlie Parker, Bird. And he used to sit around and tell us stories that some of them were harrowing because Bird would do anything to get a fix. You know, he was a heroin addict, mm. including stealing Jackie's axe and taking it down to the pawn shop. And But before he did that, he said, don't trust anyone, Jackie. And, then he ended up, I mean, he was really a character. I mean, well, not a character, obviously. He had a lot of demons. Uh, but uh, Jackie McLean, the reason I thought of him as I read through the book was uh, you have a little thing called the beauty of dissonance. Mm. Mm -hmm. And even with Coltrane, I couldn't get down with when he really went out there. Uh, mm. And Jackie McLean plays just a slightly flat underneath the note. It's his thing. It's not far enough to make you go, what the fuck, this guy can't. But it's enough to actually turn your whole insides in a completely different direction. It's the only time, what, like Jackie used to turn me on uh, when, when we recorded together and we used to go to his gigs and so on. So dissonance is an interesting thing because it's also about, you know, we don't want to be uncomfortable in any way, which is what that whole Wim Hof thing about getting in ice water, you know, it's experiencing something opposite to what your comfort zone is, is a wake up call, right? Mm -hmm. Is that how you would uh, feel about dissonance? I mean, I think that's a good way to put it. It's contrasting harmony with disharmony, um, and it's real. I mean, there's a lot of disharmony in reality in life, right? Especially if you look at the social situation, the political situation is. That's a whole, whole way understatement, as they say, for today, yeah. but yeah. So acknowledging disharmony and even using it as a, a balance, a contrast, to harmony is uh, a beautiful thing. I mean, it, composers have used it. Mozart used it, dissonance. Wagner used dissonance. Uh, many composers use dissonance. You know, it's, I think somebody, I, one idea is that the ideal is to have the middle way between disharmony and harmony. Now, mm. uh, that's, that's an idea. Um, 
that I, I have a hard time uh, relating to on a personal level because, of course, I'm much more attracted to harmony, which really, I believe, underlines all of existence, peace, harmony, and beauty. So yeah. it's, 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 it's a hard concept to, to really cuddle up to, but it has its uses. Yeah. I think you, uh, one has to be on the level of a Coltrane or someone like that to be able to express in a way that doesn't um, stray from the art just to make a statement which I think I have heard that before with, you know, I was a huge jazz fan when I was a teenager. And I used to go, I saw, you know, people like Sonny Rollins and Mingus. And Mingus was incredible. Charlie Mingus. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. the kind of compositions and, and so on. Yeah. And Monk. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wonder what's happening today because I don't follow it. I was just going to say, you, you would love some of the musicians out today. Mm. Uh, Kamasi Washington, Robert Glasper. Now, Robert Glasper is, is a jazz musician who plays R&B jazz. And it's beautiful stuff. It's fantastic stuff. Really? Yeah. There's, What's his um, name again? Robert Glasper. Okay, everybody, whoever's doing the show notes for this, please, let's link up to these guys that are just mentioned, aforementioned by Richard, okay? Yeah, Absolutely. Robert Glasper, Kamasi Washington. Because um, I want to check them out, so let's give everybody an opportunity to check them out, especially uh, you who are any kind of a affectionado of jazz. I got one for you, Flying yeah. Lotus, because huh. he's the nephew of Alice Coltrane. Oh, really? Flying yeah. Lotus is the name Flying of Flying his... Lotus. People call him Flylo. Uh, he's got his own label. Great jazz, influenced hip-hop. Uh, wow. Com combines jazz with hip-hop. Great stuff. Okay. Please link it up. Yeah. So we will. And, do and, it. and I do it too. <laughs> oh, modestly. This is an opportunity because I know you're making a record right now. What is that going to be? And can you share? Well, yeah. Um, I resisted the idea of making a record um, for several reasons. One reason is because all the techniques that I'm teaching. Uh, in the book, mainly are about listening to your own inner music and encouraging you to be able to hear your interior sound and silence. So how do you make a record like that? I mean, you know, that's difficult to do. It's, it's a lot of work that didn't attract me. But I just thought that uh, I had somebody interview me and she said, is there any kind of meditation music that isn't the new age, typical ambient, anything else like that? And a few people had asked me that. And I'm thinking, why not create music that's based on R&B, jazz, hip hop, because that's the kind of music that I do, and make that meditative. Make that the kind of music that can help people settle in to a concentrated, calm state of mind. And you know, the, the other reason I was resisting is because music is a bridge to a place, but it's not that place. And I didn't want to confuse people to think that, oh, you're listening to music and that's the end of meditation. That's it. You've meditated. That's all there is. And, and that's not the case. Meditation is like, think of a keyboard with all these different notes, right? So music is one of the notes. But so is mindfulness, so is uh, pure awareness. I mean, we can go just, or just to relieve anxiety. There's so many things that meditation does. And so I was hesitant, but because of those reasons, I decided, well, I'm not gonna worry about, uh, I'll, I'll have the message that there'll be versions of the songs where there's silence at the end, and then the song comes back. So, um, I created this album called Ambient Soul and the Pleasures of Peace, which has music in it to get you in a mindfulness state, to pay attention, to focus in a calm way, to get you in a state where you can listen to 
the sounds in your room, the sounds within you, and the silence, and based on R&B, jazz, and hip-hop. Cool. When is that happening? Well, the single, this is uh, the, the first single, Dark of the Night, Bright of the Stars, comes out this Friday. Oh. And then we'll, you know, that's June the 3rd, I think. Okay, another thing for the show notes, link, we'll link that up on Spotify. And uh, yeah, give us all a chance. That's great. Great, Richard. So speaking of what you're doing now, can you, a little bit of history of, I mean, you've been in the music business for quite some time. How about some highlights of your experiences therein? Yeah, um, you're right. I've been doing music my whole professional life. Um, it's it's hard to. I w I would say probably um, a couple of the highlights was working with uh, Bell Biv DeVoe, New Edition members of New Edition, Bell Biv DeVoe, and the first mm -hmm. record that crossed over R and B, hip hop, and pop, Poison. That was certainly oh, was really? a highlight. Poison. Yeah, working uh, on a Prince song with Prince, even though it was very remote, our communications were always through an interpreter. Um, <laughs> but that was a highlight. It's a highlight working with Freddie Mercury, um, his last album, and working with his voice uh, and being entrusted to uh, to create a, a production based on just his voice. Um. Wow. You know, there's there's a song I did uh, on a cartoon called Static Shock that, that I thought was uh, was really cool. Um, working on NCIS was a lot of fun. Cyber goth, uh, working writing music for a character who was a goth girl, so uh, completely different than meditation. You know, everything totally the opposite. Supposed to be unnerving. Very fast, very aggressive, uh, and a lot of fun. That's great. So I think every project, you know, you find something. I think that in every project you find something and then you just move on. You know, I don't, I don't dwell. I'm not attached to any of the stuff. It's stuff you did, I did and what's, you know, what's tomorrow? I'm always hearing music in my mind no matter what I'm doing. Oh, you just keep moving. You had Krishnadas on, didn't you, on, on your yeah. podcast? Yeah, that's how I. That's how we met. Yes, that's how we so met. So what he exemplifies in the West, you know, Indian chant, basically. We were doing in India when we were kids, and of course he was already uh, a musician. I mean, he was interested in music. He was even was going to sing for. Uh, what was that famous rock band back in Long Island that he, um, well, I can't remember their name, but a, a major band. They wanted him to be the lead singer. So he was into it. And, uh, but basically, long story short, what came back to here, to the West, basically, uh, was our own practice, which was kirtan, which was chant. Yeah. rhythmic and of course we were westerners and you know krishnas is you jai utah i don't know if you know jai using oh you would like him he's a real musician krishnas is like a musician that is serving who he is mm -hmm. rather than a musician who is a professional quote-unquote musician and uh, so a lot of the melodies were from the back, from our background, in this case, Christian Das, who's uh, it would all be Western chord change. It was stuff that was familiar, so people could jump into it very easily. Mm -hmm. Rhythmic, familiar chord changes, you know, great little hooky melodic things, and then suddenly you're, the medicine's going down pretty easy. Mm. You're not even thinking, mm. and that is what we have represented. I to this day, I do it, and you know, I don't do it uh, in any other way except having you know 20 30 people over we do mm -hmm. some kirtan and hang and food and kirtan which is what neem karoli baba had us doing in india the whole time we were there 
He just would man, make sure we got fed and we'd say, that was it. That's love, serve, remember, which is the only instructions we ever got from it. What is it, love, serve? Love, serve, remember, which is remember. the name of the foundation that serves all of this that gets represented, Be Here Now Network, which we are on. This sounds like a commercial or something, uh, and Ram Dasdari and everything else. But more the point is uh, that uh, talking about music and mindfulness, boy, oh boy, that uh, that's everything that we use predominantly as a practice is definitely what kirtan is nothing more than a meditation and a way to become more mindful because it serves the same purpose. So, yeah, uh, we are so with you, Richard, on this. <laughs> I can't tell you. But you know what I loved? Uh, one, this one thing, uh, the art of deep listening, I think that has to be talked about. I think that is so important in so many different ways. And you quote, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite, infinite. William Blake. Huh? Yeah. Great quote from him. Um, yeah, okay, we can exchange. Like, what do you mean about deep listening? And then well, first of all, I got to say with that, you know, Krishna Das is a big crush of mine. And to, <laughs> to me, he's beyond singing and, uh, you know, beyond sound and silence. He's the real deal. Um, and you and you sing uh, when you do kirtan. You're singing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, neuroscientifically, singing stimulates the vagus nerve. I have no idea what that means. No, I'm kidding. I I know the, I don't know everything the vagus nerve does. I know it does a lot of things. It goes all the way to your brain. But I know that when you stimulate it's a good that thing, somehow we know. Yeah. <laughs> I I know when you stimulate that by singing. That stimulates the parasympathetic nervous mm. system, which I know something about. That's the, the system that balances the fight or flight. Mm. You know, the sympathetic ner nervous system, that's the system that gets you to relax. So scientifically, when you're singing, that's got such a tranquilizing effect that's scientifically proven. But you wanted to talk about deep listening. Yeah. And... Uh, that's the thing, that's a, a sensibility or skill, whatever you want to call that, that we have as musicians that we can port over to our practice of meditation. Just being able to listen with as much attention as possible without being distracted or shattered in terms of our attention. And that is a, a, a real gift in terms of being able to concentrate and being able to find that calm, composed state of mind and being. And to me, every sound is an echo of the soundless. So sound is a gateway to silence, to the soundless, which is really uh, a place that uh, we want to be beyond sound, beyond silence, to the source of sound and silence. And so sound and music, these are gateways to get there. And another thing about deep listening is just practically speaking in life, you know, you're used to listening to music and being discerning. If you're listening to Mingus or Coltrane, you're discerning what he's doing harmonically, you're discerning what the drummer's doing you know, you're totally into the music, but you're listening carefully, deeply to the music. But when you're in life and somebody's talking to you, a lot of, you're only listening with half an ear a lot of times. But if you realize you can mindfully listen to people and give them your full attention, that's what they really would value. That's what they value. They, they want to be heard. They want to right be listened on. to. And you can also hear what they're not saying. You know, it's like Miles said, listen to the notes that aren't there. It's, it's, you know, you can hear what people are not saying. The writer, Simon Weil, I believe, the quote, this quote comes from her and it's, 
the most important and gracious offering that you can make to an un- another human being is to give them full attention. Mm. The most mm. generous offering you can make. And is it not that so? It's so, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in all of our interactions, you know, and I know, and I'm, I'm a little bit of an ADD person, multitask. I'm, I'm really, you know, um, if I didn't meditate, I don't know, I'd probably be have burnt into a little burnt puppy already. Uh, but uh, yeah, absolutely, I see clearly because fortunately, after all these years, I I can see the arising self motivation easily as it comes up, and I I see how I'm distracting from just being completely present, which is, by the way, you know, when I, I I've told this a billion times, Richard, but it deserves it again because we're talking about being here and now. Mm-hmm. Right? And mm-hmm. Mr. B here and now, when I first met him, he completely let go of, of his identities and was totally present in the moment and something I had not experienced before. That kind of um, complete attention so he and he did that throughout his life even when he was going through stuff and whatever uh not the least of which was a stroke uh Mm. he was able to do that he was able to do it extraordinary that i could witness that you know just extraordinary yeah Uh, Yeah, i mean yeah i'm sorry no 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 go ahead because you mentioned the stroke yeah and um, you know, I never read Be Here Now. If I did, I forgot, but I did read a Spiritual Journey. It was about meditation. And I saw this documentary after he had a stroke about him. That's Fierce the first Grace. time I saw Krishna Das too. He's in that documentary. Yeah. And everything you're saying is, I mean, it's right on the money as far as he's concerned to have suffered this stroke. And to have been so at peace with it, you know, every, it, you know, if it happened to me, I go, why is this happening to me? You know, how horrible is catastrophe. He did say that. He said, as he was uh, being, you know, shoveled down the corridor in the gurney when it, and he's looking up at the pipes and going, what Maharaj, were you out to lunch? What, <laughs> what happened? You know? <laughs> and then it switched into, he, uh, he gave me, the guru, gave me the stroke in order for me to become who I truly am, blah, blah. He went to India just before he started living in Maui. And he went to India in 2004 and uh, hadn't been there, obviously, in a long time. And it was a tough road to hoe, but he made it. And he met this saint, a uh, woman saint who was close to Neem Karoli Baba, named Siddhima, uh, mm-hmm. our Indian mother. And he's and she had heard him say, "Oh, Mahar Neem Karoli Baba gave me the stroke." And he'd say this kind of mm. what ended up being BSy kind of stuff because she said, "Are you kidding? The Guru is not giving you a stroke. Who would? Nature. It's called nature. Mm. You had a stroke, and uh. nature meant you know he wasn't really taking care of himself." Uh, he was overweight. He wasn't taking his blood pressure. You know, all of the stuff that contributes to someone, you know, karma. That's mm-hmm. what it was about. What he gave you was the grace of having the perspective to use it to flourish in a way that he hadn't quite flourished before. That's a kind of funny word to use, but it's come up lately, actually. I love it. So, yeah, it was that was what it was about for him and he did absolutely become whoever he was talking about uh, where he was talking from prior to the stroke he became that thing Mm -hmm. so that was the beauty of it yeah it's beautiful the way you put it the grace that's that's perfect way to describe his personality it's uh his attitude i mean when i saw the the documentary he's dancing in his wheelchair you know, pretty yeah. much. He's clapping along with the music. He's just joyful. 
And uh, it's a real, it's a real inspiration, something to really look up to. Mm, absolutely. Um, it was a beautiful yeah. model for us all. Beautiful. So also uh, another interesting story I just happened upon um, uh, that you met up with Easy e You got to tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, famous, famous rapper who had a a, a a label called Ruthless Records and NWA was there. I mean, they were, it was a famous kind of situation that Jerry Heller, who, yeah. Uh, tell us about this. I well, know a yeah, little. NWA, big, big rap group with famous rappers, Easy e Ice Cube, Dr. Dre. So Dr. Dre left, yeah, he was the producer. He produced all their hits for all their records. And uh, he was, he left the band, the band broke up and Easy e was doing a solo record and he needed a producer. And at that time, my partner and I, we were a team called Wolf and Epic. His name is Brett Epic Mazer and I'm Wolf. And um, so we were a team producing hip hop and we were pretty successful. And so Jerry would call and, um, I, I didn't want to talk to him. This is this is something about uh, deep listening. I didn't even want to hear what he had to say. But my partner talked to him. And he would call all the time and say, come on over to, you know, we have an office in Woodland Hills. Easy wants to meet you. His, his real name was Eric. You know, Eric wants to meet you, wants to talk to you. And I would say to my partner, why are you talking to him? You know, he's misogynistic. He's homophobic. We 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 don't want anything to do with this, and uh, so we we just ignored it. Finally, my partner said to me after like the tenth time that Jerry called, he said, "Let's just listen to what they have to say." It's very wise. My partner he was like seventeen years younger than me. He was like I don't know fifteen at the time, something like that. Really? Uh, well, I was a seventeen or eighteen at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so we went over there. And uh, I'm very skeptical, but there was Jerry. It was a small, you know, Eric's office was very small. He's sitting behind a desk and there's Jerry. And they were like normal people, regular people. And there was, you could see the father-son dynamic, the love between Jerry and, and Eze and the respect, the mutual respect. And I think we, that disarmed us, you know, and they were just, you know, um, pretty humble, not, threatening at all, not boasting at all, and uh, and just trying to talk and say, why can't we work together? And um, we'd say we'd keep meeting with them, and, and he used to come to my studio and hang out. You know, he was watching us create music he was into. We're all lovers of hip-hop and funk, and we would listen to funk, or we were producing or remixing something, and he would hang out. He'd come with, easy, he would come with... Uh, two bulging pockets. In one pocket, it was weed. In the other pocket was $100 bills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and um, anyway, we became friends. And finally, we had a meeting in his office. And I said, look, if you can guarantee us you're not going to have homophobic, misogynistic, or randomly violent lyrics, we'll do, you know, you want us to do half the album? We'll do half the album. And he laughed at me. And he said, y'all are crazy. And uh, I said, you know, we're crazy and you're, you're sane, but that's how we feel. And, uh, and we left on good terms. And then my partner formed a, a group, uh, a Jewish rap group called Blood of Abraham <laughs> with spiritual lyrics that Easy e loved and signed to his label and executive produced. No, so. uh, that's so funny. Wow. So the easy that I knew that I saw was a sweetheart. Really, <laughs> I, in business he was okay. He was ruthless in business, and but it, it, with us, it was not a problem. And uh, just as a person, in terms of being respectful of everybody, I, that's all I ever saw. Hmm. That gangster image was an image. Right. Uh, towards the. Uh, Another thing that caught my eye was uh, this, your little chapter on transcending the self. Mm -hmm. And I've been working a lot on uh, a project that is basically quoting Krishnadas, which is you wake up 
in the morning to the movie of me. You're the producer, director, protagonist. Uh, <laughs> you're the whole writer. You're the whole thing 24-7. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so we're working on something from the... Uh, from the movie of me to the movie of we that I'm working on with a friend of mine. So oh. this transcending the self, and, and that's what, uh, when I read that, that's what I'm thinking. And, and then you quote uh, Bruce Springsteen, who mm. we all love more than love. Um, and he said, I think you saw in an article that he said music, performing music for him was a, was a vehicle for self erasure i love that mm -hmm. so much right mm -hmm. oh my god um uh, and 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 then you also quote eminem lose yourself one of mm -hmm. his songs and that mm -hmm. yeah i don't know if you can say what else you can say about but say something because that is what it is all about as yes. far as i'm concerned that is absolutely correct okay that is I what it's all about <laughs> <laughs> that is my favorite part. That is the most important part of the whole deal, whether yeah. you're talking about music and yeah. you're talking about meditation. It's in music, you're connecting with something that's beyond. It's transpersonal. That's why people love to sing the national anthem when they go to a ball game or every religion that I'm aware of, people are singing, you know, kirtan or hymns, whatever. And every, every religion has people singing together because you're connecting beyond yourself. And then you're connecting beyond everything with through music. The problem is that you get this high, right? You're, as Springsteen says, I rise up and I vanish into the music. I, you, you mentioned vanish and it's a high, but the problem is that you got to come down off the stage and you got to come down off your high and then you got to live with yourself again. And, Not fun <laughs> for these people. Yeah. Right. Difficult. And you have to face the challenges of your life now. And so many musicians, they get, you know, they're, they're down at the bottom of the stage, you know, and now what do I do? I'm lost. I have no more purpose. Yeah. And then when you meditate, you can realize that, wait a second, you're not only an instrument when you're playing music, your whole life is an instrument of something that's bigger than you. And your purpose is limitless. And when you see that, it really helps you face the fact that you now have to live with yourself because you find out that the self that you have to live with is not what you think it is. That's a biggie. That takes lifetimes of practice. It does. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, what, obviously the thing isn't to become, as Jack Cornfield says, a good meditator. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's mm -hmm. to become a loving, kind, compassionate mm -hmm. purpose, a, mm -hmm. a person rather, mm -hmm. with that purpose in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I do, one other thing that struck me, uh, I do love this quote from John Cage uh, that you put in here. I always like quotes from people like this. I had accepted the idea that the purpose of music is to sober and quiet the mind, thus making one susceptible to divine influences. Mm. True right, true on, you know. Totally. Although I must uh, say I have never been able to absorb John's music <laughs> for uh, talk about um, dissonance uh -huh. and weird rhythmic structures and so on. Oh boy. I guess that's why I like, I loved when I was a kid, pop music. I mean, I still love a good hook and a chorus. You got me right. That was always really important. Uh, and that's the beauty of it all. Boy, there's something for absolutely, it's like Hinduism. There's something for everyone in it. There's a billion gods and goddesses and practices. Yeah. Well, Cage, as you know, was uh, studied Zen. He yeah, was a student was a, of D.T. Suzuki and uh, very influenced by that. Uh, all of what we've been talking about, we got a lot of links here for sure. 
uh, two mm-hmm. different wonderful musicians and um, thought leaders and so on. So we'll have that all in our show notes. So you just got to go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash MindRolling and you'll get hooked up, including the new single from Richard. Oh, Richard, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, really happy to meet you, especially through this particular medium. This is Mind Rolling on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and we shall see you next week. Bye. Bye, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic.